Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. On behalf of our literary committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, a conversation with Congressman Jamie Raskin about his formidable book, Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. Today's conversation will once again be led by skilled moderator and host of the New York City-based Page Turner's reading series, Glenn Rauscher. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me turn it over to Glenn. Please enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much, Nadine. Um, my name is Glenn Rauscher, host of the Page Turner's Reading Series, formerly the Half King Reading Series. Uh, I wanted to say thank you very much to the good people at the National Arts Club, to Nadine and Julie and Rose, who have uh, given me the honor of guest hosting some of their wonderful at-home events and some of their in-person events too. Uh, it is a Thursday night in New York City, a beautiful fall evening. And as we know, on any given night, uh, wherever you are, there are 10,000 different things that you could be doing, and none of us involved in this event take for granted that you've chosen to be here with us. So thank you very, very much for that. Your reward is to have an evening with the author of Unthinkable, Representative Jamie Raskin. As Nadine mentioned, we do want you to be a part of this event. Do put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and I would like to emphasize questions. We all know very well that this is a topic uh, that Representative Raskin is writing on that is uh, very stimulating. We want to make sure that you form your thoughts in the shape of a question. We cannot get to all of them. We'll get to as many as we can. If we don't pick yours, it is not personal. We're not going to get to all of my 177 questions either, I can promise you. Uh, books are available this evening from Books on Call NYC, New York's only exclusively off-site bookseller. Nadine will be posting the link in the chat portion of the Zoom screen. All formats are available. And please remember that New York City does have a two-book minimum. Mm -hmm. And now on to our featured author. Unthinkable tells three seemingly distinct stories. The loss of a remarkable, gifted, complicated and deeply compassionate young man and the pain his family endured and endures. The January 6th insurrection against the Capitol, against democracy itself, and the second impeachment trial of the former president. But one of the gifts of Representative Raskin's book are the connections he makes between the private and national trauma. Unthinkable is a book that makes the phrase, the personal is political, genuinely meaningful again. Over and over, Representative Raskin writes of his and our failures of imagination are not believing the worst can and does happen despite the evidence of all history. The anger and disbelief throughout the chapters on January 6th and the impeachment trial are palpable. And the sense of the tenuousness of democracy as violent autocratic forces test its joins are made extraordinarily tangible. What could be a dry academic reading is instead visceral and still shocking. But leavening that is the book's persistent humanity, which Jamie links back to his children, all three, Tabitha, Hannah, and Tommy, who Jamie credits with being his best teachers, both through their own sterling character and as a constant reminder that no matter the darkness, there is something to live for, to fight for, to try again and again to make things right, knowing and bearing what can be an enormous cost. Time and again, he learns profound lessons from his own children. It's a tribute to him and his wife, Sarah, a lucky thing and a very rare trait. 
This special book is a letter to an American, to an America in individual and collective grief, an argument against existential despair and a creed de corps expressing genuine patriotism in the words deepest sense about how great it is to be alive and how hard it is to be human. From wherever you are, please join me in welcoming Representative Jamie Raskin. Glenn, uh, thank you for that. I, I've never, um, I've never had the fortune of meeting you before, but um, um, I, I couldn't ask for a, a better or more thoughtful reader than you. And uh, I'm, I'm choked up just listening to your introduction. So thank you for those beautiful words. Well, thank you. Thank you for this, this wonderful book. Uh, I wanted to start by asking you, if you don't mind, to begin with the epigram that is below the dedication at the beginning of the book. Can you, can you read that for us? It's brief. This is Sophocles. Uh, one word frees us of all the weight and pain of life. The word is love. Why that epigram to begin the book? Well, you know, as you suggested, you know, the, the book is, um, I guess, in the first sense, a love letter to my lost son, Tommy, but it became also a love letter to my daughters, um, to our family, and then to the country. And um, uh, I think that to the extent that we've been able to go on and to persist and to uh, continue to render service in our lives. It has been only really because of love of uh, one another and of Tommy uh, and of the country. And um, uh, otherwise it would be almost unbearable. You describe your son's life as comprehensively utilitarian. I love that phrase. What, how did, what does that entail? Well, Tommy um, always sought to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number of people and the greatest number of animals. So he wanted to extend the uh, perspective of utilitarianism to include all living beings. And he was a, a passionate vegan and he converted more people to not eating meat than anybody uh, I ever met, certainly. I mean, dozens and dozens of people. I still meet people on the street who tell me that Tommy converted them in life or that they've read about him and they can't go on eating meat. They've seen his poetry or they've read about him in my book or whatever. Um, but he was a great champion of human rights, a great enemy of war and uh, tyrants and dictators. And, um, you know, I see him now like, uh, like a visitor, like a messenger from a time hundreds of years from now. Um, when, you know, life is a lot better um, and we're not consumed with, uh, you know, the, all the despots and the racism and the fascism and the authoritarianism. And he, he came from a time when, uh, We were through all that, you know, but it was too much for him to live in this world. Yeah. Too much. So, you, you you said that he had. Uh, you write in the book, and this comes across so clearly. He had a, a real gift, you, and you talk about him converting people to veganism. Of course, the the phrase "converting someone" has obviously can have some very negative connotations, but that wasn't him at all. What made him so adept at making connections between people? Well, I mean, for Tommy, I mean, none of his politics were about guilt tripping people. Um, you know, the way that he would, um, people would ask him, well, why, why do you not eat meat? And then he had, um, he would get up and he would perform poetry that he had done. And he had multiple poems about it. But one that's very powerful that, I, that you can find online is called where war begins. And it's about the connection between dulling our moral sensibilities by routinely eating animal flesh uh, and then conditioning people to accept violence against human beings. Um, and it's an extraordinary poem, but he, you know, he had multiple poems and he had a photographic memory. So he would get up and he would just, you know, 
do these spellbinding performances for 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Um, and um, it was an incredibly moving thing to watch and it would just affect people. But he also had a deal, which is that if anybody asked him about it, he would take them out for a vegan dinner or lunch or whatever and have a meal or try and make it as best as he could, uh, depending, I guess, on who his girlfriend was at the time, whether they they were uh, they were good cooks or not, you know. But um, yeah, and so um, he he oftentimes would fight with the other uh, animal rights people who you know sometimes would be holier than thou and kind of politically correct about the whole thing. I think some of them were uh, rendering uh, moral judgments about. Uh, you know, beyond beyond burgers and impossible burgers and all that. And they were saying, you know, you shouldn't create uh, counterfeit meats that just mimic what animal flesh is. And Tommy was arguing, well, why not? I mean, that, that advances the greatest good if you're going to wean people off of eating real hamburgers to eat fake burgers, they get the enjoyment of eating you know, a burger that tastes exactly the same if you put ketchup on it and you save some, some cow's life, you know? And so, um, he, he loved to debate. He did debate when he was in high school. Um, although his, uh, his partners reported that, um, he, he was not technically a good debater because that was all about how fast you could speak and how many points you could get in. And Tommy really wanted to convince people so he would wax really beautifully, rhetorically eloquent uh, and try to move people and tell stories and things that you weren't supposed to do. And they were always trying to get him back on, you know, just uh, kind of machine gun style rattling off the point. He, se he seemed to have a, a desire. You know, I think one of the things, and maybe this is obviously connected to his veganism, but he really seemed to live the principle of, of first do no harm. There's a, a wonderful story you write about in the book. Uh, I wonder if you could if share the story. Um, in high school, Tommy um, comes to find that other students are cheating. And can you tell me what he does and how he tries to find a, a, a different path than perhaps most students would? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, there was rampant cheating going on. Uh, and uh, he was always careful to say it wasn't just his high school, his public high school he was in, but it was all the schools, public, private. He knew of a lot of cheating going on and he uh, confirmed it with his sisters and his cousins and so on. And so he basically said that there were multiple kinds of cheating taking place. So obviously the student who was cheating was not really learning the material. Um, and the teachers or the school was getting to pass people without actually really teaching them. So everybody was being cheated out of a real education. And then he said, everybody was demoralized and uh, essentially denigrated by the exercise because in, instead of drawing on people's healthy instinct to cooperate and teach each other, and Tommy had started uh, you know, a, a peer counseling a peer tutoring group, you know, people were just treating knowledge like property and then stealing it and selling it and all that kind of crazy stuff. So anyway, he would get up and object in class. So they'd be in the middle of a test and he'd get up and he'd say, I object. I'm not naming names, but I know there's cheating going on here. And he would try to interrupt the whole cycle and say, I think we need to talk about what's going on here. Um, but he did start this uh, group at his wonderful high school, Blair High School called Bliss, uh, which is still going, which is a very powerful group for peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, which he said was the opposite of cheating. Yes. You, you write a bit in the book about the power of the words not spoken. Can you tell us how important is it to say the difficult things to the people that you love? Well, one of the many things that I condemn myself for in the book is not having used the word suicide, um, even though we knew Tommy w was struggling with depression, of course, and had doctors and was taking medication. Um, and, uh, you know, now I wish it had been a daily subject of conversation, but I think I was operating under the false belief that 
to speak the word would be to endow it with a kind of um, importance and inevitability and predestination that would be dangerous. But of course, it's, if anything, the relationship is the reverse. By not speaking it, you inflate its power over people and over things. And so, I, I mean, I just, you know, it's one of the things that I uh, continue to prosecute myself for. But um, it's the same with the word fascism. And I talk about that in the book, that that was a, a word that was just considered completely impolite and indelicate to, to mention. Uh, you know, it's like a faux pas to mention fascism. Um, but I saw what fascism looks like on January 6th. And I, you know, I, I felt what it meant. And uh, if you read Madeleine Albright's last book, Fascism, A Warning, she says it's very important to use the word and also to understand that fascism is a mutating uh, condition and uh, it doesn't always have the exact same ideological contents at one time that it had in another, but ultimately it's a strategy for taking power for small groups of people uh, based on hatred and contempt and the mobilization of uh, negative emotions in the, in the population. You just grabbed my next question from me. So I'm gonna, uh, that, that's, I was gonna say, what does that mean and what does it look like? And you answered it, thank you for that. You use a really vivid phrase in the book that is relevant to what we're talking about, fascist breadcrumbs. What are those? Well, um, in hindsight, everything looks perfectly obvious, looked immediately perfectly obvious. And in fact, you know, there's this wonderful woman, Madeline Carter, who was making a documentary about me at the time that, you know, a couple, she started a couple of years before any of these things happened before we lost Tommy before January 6th, but she had some footage showing me to, warning about violence and saying there was going to be violence. And, you know, and I, I think I, I probably, you know, forgot how much it was on my mind, but the one thing that I definitely did not perceive was the realistic possibility that the violence would overcome the Capitol Police and the, the mob would be able to smash our windows and tear down our doors and basically blow holes through all of the security and drive the House and the Senate out of our chambers and drive the Vice President out of the Capitol. Um, so I, I didn't see that, but the fascist breadcrumbs were all of these, um, well, I suppose the kids called them um, microaggressions uh, that were strewn along the path leading up to January 6th. I tell the story about our daughter, Hannah, and uh, her husband, Hank, who came to town and they stayed at a hotel and they were staying with some of the insurrectionists and there were proud boys and, you know, different people were staying there. And I recited a scene that they described of them giving the hotel people a hard time and the angry words exchanged and what was, you know, what was taking place in the days building up to January 6th. Um, you, you talk a lot and you've mentioned so far in our conversation about sort of uh, self-criticism, uh, but isn't, isn't it sort of a, a a national issue. I think one of the things I think people had a very hard time with is the idea that the former president wasn't just winging it, that there was a method to his madness. I think about the, the, the debate that he had with President Biden, where he was asked about the Proud Boys and made that famous quotation about, uh, you know, Proud Boys st uh, stand back and stand by. And I think a lot of people said, well, that's just his word vomit, but you believe there's method to him. Can you, can you explain why people missed that? And of course it wasn't just you, it was most people. Well, that was like Trump saying, Russia, if you're listening, go and find uh, Hillary's 20,000 emails. Uh, and uh, Russia actually took, you know, Putin and his, uh, his spies took that as marching orders. Um, and it was the same thing. I mean, just because uh, you call for criminal violence in public doesn't mean you didn't call for criminal violence, you know, and people have a harder time believing 
that somebody would murder someone in public than do it privately, which is why Trump says, oh, well, yes, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and it would lose me no support. Um, but uh, that was at the first presidential debate, the very first one where he was asked to denounce and renounce the domestic violent extremist groups. And he said, well, you know, I don't know any of these groups, which one? And they said, Proud Boys. And he said, Proud Boys stand, stand back and stand by, which they immediately adopted as their motto and put out um, sweatshirts, t-shirts, baseball caps and everything. And they, um, based on testimony that was received yesterday in court, I think, uh, they say that they more than tripled their membership um, within a 24 to 48 hour period after Trump told them to stand back and stand by. And of course, that was the exact same role that the Oath Keepers and Stuart Rhodes, the Yale Law School, Law School graduate, who's the leader of the Oath Keepers, imagined for themselves. Um, you know, they were hoping that there would be some kind of veneer of legal legitimacy pasted onto them by having... Donald Trump invoke the Insurrection Act and declare martial law. Of course, the Insurrection Act only allows the president to call up militias by which the Constitution and the law means state organized militias, well regulated militias, as the Second Amendment puts it, which means well regulated by the government, not random bands of fascists who want to take state power. So even had Trump done it, it would provide no legal defense to Stuart Rhodes and the gang. But in any event, they wanted to use that as a cover for going and engaging in violent insurrection. And um, as I tried to argue in an op-ed that I published in the New York Times on Sunday, um, this form of violent insurrectionism is, under the Second Amendment is now an article of faith within the GOP. They actually believe the myth that the purpose of the Second Amendment is to give the people the right to overthrow the government, even though there are a half dozen uh, passages in the Constitution which directly contradict and refute that, like Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, which says Congress has the power to call forth the militias of the states in order to do three things, enforce the law, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, or the Republican Guarantee Clause, which says that Congress has the power and Congress shall uh, guarantee to the people of the states a Republican form of government and assist them in putting down domestic violence. And just to give you one more example of many, but Section 3 of the 14th Amendment said, which was adopted after the Second Amendment, of course, uh, after the Civil War, where the radical Republicans added language saying that anybody who swears an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution um, and abandons the oath by engaging in insurrection or rebellion shall never be allowed to hold public office again at the federal or state level. So we have a constitution which comprehensively rejects insurrection, and yet that is now a rallying point for uh, Trump's cult of authoritarian personality, which used to be called the Republican Party. D David, uh, questions are coming in. Thank you, folks, for submitting them. David asks, uh, we understand the phrase stand back to mean cool it for now, but do you read stand by as literally be ready to pick up the violence when the time is right? Well, yes, of course. I mean, that, that's precisely what happened. I don't think we have to engage in any uh, imaginative reconstruction of events. I think that's precisely what happened. And um, look, Donald Trump was perfectly well aware that there were armed people coming into the crowd because, you know, uh, obsessed as always with crowd size, he was uh, heckling the Secret Service and his managers saying there aren't enough people in the crowd and there's, and he's getting the reports. Well, they're holding them back uh, because they've got to go through the metal detectors or they don't want to go through the metal detectors because they've got their firearms with them. And he says, take down the mags, take down the magnetometers, let them all in. Uh, I don't care whether they're armed because they're not there to hurt me. So he knew they were armed. He knew they were dangerous, but he didn't fear them, uh, which suggests not only that he knew something uh, about why they were armed, um, but he understood perfectly well that they would be a danger to somebody else. And he wanted to march with them because he imagined himself like Mussolini being carried on the shoulders of the mob into the Capitol where... Um, he would basically be declared president again if they could just get 
um, Vice President Mike Pence or uh, you know, a hastily thrown in substitute to assert unilateral unlawful powers to reject electoral college votes from Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. And at that point, they were just going to call it a day, either right up there on the floor or kick it all into a so-called contingent election under the 12th Amendment. But either way, it was going to end up with him declaring himself president, likely invoking the Insurrection Act, and finally calling forth the National Guard, someone he had not talked to all day, just like he had never called the Secretary of Defense or the Metropolitan Police or the Capitol Police, nobody, but he was going to call them in at that point to put down the insurrectionary chaos he'd unleashed against us, but blame the whole thing on Antifa. You, you, you write in the book that a lot of people thought that the DC National Guard was being held back because Trump wanted to deploy it in conjunction with civil unrest. What, what was that belief based on? Well, you know, the, the, the key event that was in people's minds, including mine, was um, what had happened on June the 1st. And on that day, Donald Trump and uh, and Attorney General William Barr, who at that point was still um, the, uh, completely, uh, you know, obsequious invertebrate sycophant, uh, had organized a paramilitary police riot in Lafayette Square against Black Lives Matter, including a lot of my constituents, young people who were in town. And it was totally unprovoked. But they sent police in on horseback with mace, tear gas, billy clubs, and they cleared it out. So then Trump marched across Lafayette Square to go to the St. John's Episcopal Church, uninvited, crashing the church and then waving somebody else's Bible upside down over his head, um, which is one minister reminded me was a perfect statement of his religiosity. Uh, but he probably violated each of the six rights contained in the First Amendment the freedom of speech, the freedom to assemble, the freedom to petition government for redress of grievances, the right of free exercise as he crashed the church, the establishment of religion best he could by uh, merging uh, himself um, uh, with the Bible and the free press, of course, as they smashed TV cameras and pushed reporters down and all that stuff. So, but in any event, th that was what we had in mind. Um, and there was a fear that he, he was going to use the National Guard for the purposes of what he used the mob for, disrupting the peaceful transfer of power and the counting of electoral college votes, that he was gonna put them to the purpose of putting down democracy. So there was a lot of ambiguity and ambivalence about that. But the point at the point at which the mob overran the police and overran the Capitol, it was very clear that the National Guard was absolutely needed to try to defend the constitutional process and democratic order. You mentioned the three rings of action on January 6th. What and who were they? Well, the outer ring were tens of thousands of people who just responded to Donald Trump's uh, deranged tweet calling for a wild protest against the peaceful transfer of power. I mean, ask yourself whether you can imagine any other president of the United States, you know, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Quincy Adams, all the way through, the, you know, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Is there any other president who would call for a wild protest against the counting of electoral college votes and against the peaceful transfer of power? So in any way, the tens of thousands of people showed up Within their ranks were lots of people who indeed were spoiling for a fight and uh, were, you know, amongst the bloodthirsty people who wanted to beat the hell out of police officers and so on. There were also a lot of people who may have been more innocently motivated, uh, who were just told by the president of the United States that their country was about to be stolen away from them, that the election was being stolen, and they were told, you've got to come to Washington. So he summoned them there. So that was a huge crowd that they converted into a mob. The middle ring was the ring of the insurrection itself. And these were the domestic violent extremist groups who had been carefully cultivated and mobilized and organized for the purposes of launching the violence. So it was the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the militia groups, the QAnon networks, First Amendment, uh, Praetorian, the Rod of Iron, which is a, a violent cult formed by the son of Sun Myung Moon, a, a gun cult. Um, 
there were more than a dozen of them that were brought together. Um, and it had this explosive effect um, when they began to attack these Capitol officers, of course, who had never seen anything like this before in their lives. There's never been anything like it before in American history in terms of a mass violent domestic assault on uh, the capital of the government. And nobody had seen it before and nobody was uh, really prepared for what happened. These people ended up injuring more than 150 of our officers who ended up with broken jaws, necks, fingers, arms, missing fingers, missing toes, uh, broken noses, jaws, concussions, contusions, traumatic brain injuries, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, you name it, okay. That was not even the scariest ring. The scariest ring was the inner ring of the coup. And the coup is a, is a tricky word to use in American political parlance because we don't have a lot of experience with coups within our own country. And um, usually we think of a coup as something organized by the military against a president, but political scientists have identified another kind of coup, what they call a self-coup, which is when a president fearing electoral defeat decides to overthrow the electoral process and the constitutional order. And that's a perfect description of what Donald Trump was up to from uh, the moment of his defeat in November all the way through January 6th. And as you know, he attempted uh, five or six serious efforts to uh, overthrow Joe Biden's majority, which was created by a 7 million vote um, margin of 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. And he tried to overthrow it in the state legislatures by the state election officials. They flirted with having the military seize election machines and rerun the election, which was his disgraced former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn's plan, because everybody knows about that provision in the Constitution, which allows the military to rerun the election. But then it all led up to January 6th. Let's just get the vice president to proclaim these unlawful powers to vaporize electoral college votes and then finish the whole thing in a contingent election in the House of Representatives. In both of the elections that where, where the former president ran, even before, this is a question coming from Giselle. Thank you for your question, Giselle. Even before the 2016 election against, against Hillary Clinton, he said that, well, if I lose, it's rigged. When he ran against Joe Biden, he said, well, if I lose, the, the, it's rigged which of course has the, the, the really terrifying echoes of authoritarianism. Um, yet still some people find it hard to believe that that is the intent of uh, both the former president and his most hardcore acolytes is to usher in an authoritarian state. Can you explain why people still don't believe what's right in front of them? Well, I think that's something that that people record. Certainly, writers have recorded that. Whenever fascism comes, people don't want to believe it, and um, you know, people whose nature is not to lie, cheat, and steal just constantly underestimate what can be out there. I mean, that's not the echo of fascism. That is the original sound of fascism. I mean, the political scientists tell us that the hallmarks of an authoritarian or fascist political party are uh, a cult of personality around a charismatic figure who dictates to everyone what to believe, one. Two, a refusal to accept the results of democratic elections if they don't go their way. And three, an embrace or a refusal to disavow political violence as a mechanism for achieving power. So everybody got mad at Joe Biden because he talked about the semi-fascist tactics of the MAGA Republicans. But if if the shoe semi fits, you got to wear it. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of people question the, the semi there. So people don't want to believe it. Um, we have a we all have, I think, a deep rooted belief in American exceptionalism. We believe we are an exceptional country, but we're not an exceptional country because we are somehow immune to the viruses of fascism and racism and anti-Semitism and authoritarianism. We're just not. And if you look at the kinds of uh, racist violence, uh, mob violence and uh, racist state violence that uh, African-American people have had to face throughout our history, that is from the standpoint of the victims fascism. It just is. 
Um, and so um, what makes us exceptional is not that we are intrinsically more virtuous than any other people on earth or any other country on earth or any other political system. What makes us exceptional is that we started with these sensational ideas embodied in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence about the consent of the government, uh, consent of the governed being the legitimating principle for government, that you've got to have the consent of the people and all men, we would say today, people being created equal and the unalienable rights of the people of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And we didn't start like that at all. We started as a slave republic of Christian white male property owners over the age of 21, tiny minority rule. And yet those ideas have been so intoxicating and transcendent that mass movements of Americans in every generation have taken them up and worked to concretize them in our institutions and in our social and political practices. That's what makes us exceptional. And that's what makes us today, even with all of Trump's authoritarianism and darkness, still the greatest multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious constitutional democracy on earth. That's who we are. One of the, well, a couple of questions have come in from, from Andrea M and Courtney H that deal with the concept of accountability. Um, obviously, you can even leave aside the, the ultimate ringleader, the former president, um, there are members of Congress who there is some credible evidence, knew things about what was going to happen, and it did not actively aid and abet, certainly didn't take any steps to prevent it from happening in, with the power that they had. What, what has been the challenge, and is it just the structural nature of, of essentially a bicameral system, in there being accountability for those that uh, have pushed us a little bit further down the authoritarian path? Well, I want to distinguish between two kinds of accountability, and one is individual criminal accountability. And I would say those processes are well underway with the able prosecutors of Georgia and of New York uh, who are going after Trump for what was clearly an attempt to um, conspire uh, for election fraud in Georgia just find me 11,780 votes. I mean, I'm in politics, just find me 11,780 votes. That's clearly a guy who's not trying to stop election fraud. He's trying to commit election fraud, right? So we've got, you know, that case is going on, the New York case with the very clear, overwhelmingly um, evidenced case for real estate fraud, bank fraud, insurance fraud, and so on. And then all of the evidence now about the very clear conspiracy to interfere with the federal proceeding that is the uh, casting of electoral college votes and the peaceful transfer of power and all of these charges of seditious conspiracy. I mean, all of the conspiracies that are being charged, Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, are just spin-off conspiracies of the vast conspiracy that Donald Trump started. Is there anybody in the country who believes that any of this would have happened if Donald Trump had simply accepted the results of the 2020 presidential election. I mean, there's just nobody who can make that argument. If he had just done what everybody else had done, like Al Gore did and just said, well, I disagree, but I'm going to accept this because that's the way it works. Trump brought more than 60 federal and state lawsuits, including before eight judges he had nominated the federal bench. He lost every single case, all of them, uh, completely repudiating allegations of electoral fraud or corruption that should have been the end of it. And even to this day, you've got people like Ginny Thomas who are asserting that there was still fraud, but they can't tell you what state it was in or where it happened or how it escapes any of these multiple criminal and civil investigations that took place in all of these lawsuits. So, um, you know, I mean, that's that's just a joke. Wait, Glenn, I think you're muted. My bad. Boy, what an amateur mistake that was. <laughs> so um, I felt like an interviewer there. There, there you go. Um, thank you for the heads up. Um, one of the things that I think this book does, it's a, I think it's a very brave thing, 
is it you really let readers in a, in a in a very profound way get to know you a little bit let to know the your your inner self and i think many politicians especially in the social media age get caricatured to a profound degree and you, you talk a little bit in the book about what nicknames that you'd imagine the trump team would have for you and that's a, a, a source of some some lightness in the book um i'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about speaker pelosi and how you experienced her as a person and a politician, because she she looms very large, even though she's not in the book a lot, but when she's there, there's a real power to it. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about how you experienced her throughout? Well, the, that's the that's elements? a good that's a good description of what Nancy Pelosi is like. Um, you know, you don't see her all the time. She's not omnipresent, but when she's there, you know she's there. Uh, and she has a decisive effect on the course of events. Um, but you know, I, I write about a lot about the conversation we had when she asked me to lead the impeachment team. And I say that she threw me a lifeline because she did, because it was a time when uh, I wasn't eating and I wasn't sleeping. And I was so drowning in grief and sorrow that I wasn't sure whether I would ever be able to do anything of value again in my career in my life. I just, you know, I, I just felt like I was submerged in darkness. And, um, and she shocked me by asking me to do that. And um, it's like she was saying, we needed you and we, you know, like we need you and we need you to rally and we need you to rally us. And, uh, you know, for that, I will be forever grateful to her. Um, she you know, like all great political leaders, she has exceptional um, emotional intelligence and psychological insight. Um, and she spends a lot of time understanding people's motivations and their personalities and their characters. Um, but she also uh, has a, a great sense of the sweep of history and where things are going and where they have to go. And she takes the measure of the caucus. She listens to people carefully uh, about what they're saying. And then at a certain moment, it's almost like you can see a light going off in her mind and her eyes, and she's decided what needs to be done. And then there's no looking back. And then she goes for it. And that's what I saw her do with the impeachment trial. And she decided she wanted me to do it. And uh, you know, I turned to her for advice a couple of times, but she never second guessed anything that we did. And she showed total support for the extraordinary team of uh, impeachment managers we had. And I, I can't say enough about them. I, I'm sure that everybody watching here has uh, had a, a let, let's use the term loosely supervisor who has micromanaged them to death and to have someone who just supports you um, is, is a rare, rare pleasure. You mentioned the, the phrase, emotional intelligence in your answer about Speaker Pelosi. Can you tell us about the phone call you had with President Biden after the initial impeachment presentation and what the call made you realize about him? Well, the, you know, the, I, I had security people with me at the time. And so all of the conversations I had in the car were a little bit awkward because I was aware of, you know, the fact that inevitably they were, uh, they were listening. And even if I remembered to bring the, uh, you know, the earplugs, they could still hear my side of it. And of course, I was always forgetting those. But anyway, um, <laughs> you know, um, President Biden called me after the opening day, and he said something really beautiful, which is um, your, I, I, I can't remember the exact words, but it was something to the effect of you're, you're a hell of a lawyer, but you're a much finer father. And, uh, you know, I just, I realized, you know, we've gone through a time of tremendous darkness and trauma. I mean, we've lost more than a million people to COVID-19, hundreds of thousands of people in the opioid crisis. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people over the years to emotional and mental health disorders and suicide and gun violence. Um, and, um, 
you know, the, the Trump period was, of course, a time of absolute derangement uh, where people were just horrified to pick up the newspaper to see what he had done, what he had done, you know, in the prior hours. Um, and um, so just a very hard time. And I, I realized then that Joe Biden um, was not just the right choice for the Democrats because he kind of had the broadest compass in terms of the parts of the political spectrum he covered, um, and not just because he was a kind of connection to, you know, the, the parts of the 20th century we needed to be connected to, like the Great Society and the New Deal and so on. But um, he, his emotional intelligence is such that he can connect in a profound way with people who are suffering, and so much of our population has been suffering, and he reaches out to connect to people who have suffered terrible losses. And I've got to tell you, it was it was very meaningful to Sarah and me and the girls that you know he checked in on us. Um, he and uh, and Mrs. Biden checked in on us several times, as well as the vice president too. You come at one point. To, to fully realize the, the degree of shared grief about Tommy. I think grief can be very isolating where you feel that you are, you are the only one feeling it this deeply, but you describe it as the full terrifying measure of the different dimensions of our loss. You're talking about all the, the, the sort of the multiverse of, of Tommy. What was that realization like? Devastating, I'd say. Um, I mean, because once I got through, you know, the initial shock and trauma um, and was able to step back somewhat just from the focus of the last several weeks and um, how we lost him, and then to realize that he would be gone every day that's a shocking thing. And, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, as the, the, the parents of three kids, uh, two daughters and a son, we lost our only son. And that's another kind of loss, you know, and I lost, um, um, you know, I lost someone who, a son, but who was also like a best friend in many ways to me. And so there are just all these different, just cascading forms of loss that I came to realize um, after I sort of woke up from that initial shock and trauma. And so we feel that a lot. I mean, Tommy was like the life of the party in many contexts. And so, you know, we'll, the cousins have lost that and um, it's, you know, it's just a terrible thing. It's just a very, very hard thing. But the flip side of that is that we can uh, invoke his memory and um, remember his spirit in so many different contexts. And that's a lovely thing to have him present with us in so many different ways, you know. Can you, can you tell us about some of the projects carried on in his well, there, we started, people just started, you know, calling and asking about that and then just sending money for whatever. And so we said, okay, we've got to create some structure here. So we created a fund, the Tommy Raskin Memorial Fund for people and animals. And it raised like a million and a half dollars, like in like a week or something. I mean, it was crazy. And, um, and so Tommy's sisters and cousins and close friends from Blair High School and Amherst College and uh, his classmates from Harvard Law School um, are on a board and they make the decisions to operate in Tommy's spirit and honor and to intervene uh, in refugee situations and human rights situations and for animal welfare and animal rights. And they've done some really fascinating, interesting things. But then there are all these other places that have created Tommy Raskin scholarships and Tommy Raskin lectureships and Tommy Raskin um camperships and all of this stuff and his name and his honor and um 
you know, it, it's a beautiful thing, but also it makes me think, my God, if we had, I don't know, sometimes I think if I had uh, used like whatever platforms I have to promote his ideas better when he was alive, then maybe, you know, he would not have felt so forlorn about the world. I don't know, you know, you're just, you second guess a lot of stuff in a situation like this, you know? Are, 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 are you able to turn to the people who love you and who you love and you talked about how they're having their own challenges with, with grief and loss and can you turn to them and, and when, when you start cycling into that, into that feeling and say, hey, pull me out, reset me, are you able to do that yet? Yeah. And they're able to do it for you. Well, you know, um, I, you know, well, I don't want to get overly psychological here, but I've developed certain mechanisms for okay. uh, addressing that, you know, and uh, then look, the real thing is I've been carrying Tommy so much in my heart and in my chest, I feel him and it, it drives me forward, you know, cause he, you know, he left us a note which said, um, please forgive me my illness won today look after each other the animals and the global poor for me all my love tommy and um that's the instruction manual it wasn't you know it wasn't obsess about this it was keep going and i think um i think that connects us back to sophocles right at the beginning and um I know we've got, we've got a lot of questions I, we've not been able to get to, but I think uh, that is a very good place to, to, to stop and say thank you to you so much for taking time out of what we know is your very, very, very busy schedule. For everybody watching, the link to the book is available in the chat. This is a remarkable book. This is a sort of a, 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 a life-changing book to read and experience. It'll make you look at the people around you differently. Representative Raskin, Thank you so much for doing this and I wish you and yours the best and thank you for always fighting the good fight. Well, thank you, Glenn. And thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Julie. Just, um, and uh, I think I probably got more uh, emotional and introspective than I, uh, I generally do here, but that it just relates to your very probing and sensitive reading of my book. And thank you for your kind words about it. And I am sorry we had to do it on Zoom, but I do hope some other time I'll come and get to meet the people from the National Arts Club in New York City. You guys are like the opposite of fascism. You're where, <laughs> uh, you're all about freedom and diversity and understanding and democracy. So more power to you, okay? Thank you so much. And everyone who's watching, have a wonderful night. And thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Representative Raskin. Thank you much.